knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. In the biology series, we discussed phylogeny and the tree of life. In doing so, we outlined the manner in which we classify living organisms, which we refer to as taxonomy. If you haven't seen that tutorial yet, I highly recommend giving it a watch before moving forward, as it describes this very important classification system in detail, as well as other relevant information about how the tree of life is structured. But if you remember your basic taxonomy, let's just quickly recall the various taxa. In order of increasing specificity, these are domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. Every living organism belongs to a particular species. Many species can be of the same genus. Many genera can be of the same family, and so forth. So to begin broadly, there are three domains of life, those being bacteria, archaea, and eukarya. The first two contain only unicellular prokaryotes, so head over to the microbiology series for more on those critters. Eukarya contains all the eukaryotic organisms, so that's what we are concerned with here. Now, in 1866, it was proposed that there were four eukaryotic kingdoms. These were Animalia, Plantae, Fungi, and Protista. Though this system is still occasionally taught, it has been considered inaccurate for quite some time. This is largely due to the consistently confounding protista that actually do not represent a unified kingdom. The term protist is polyphyletic and should be avoided. It is essentially a wastebasket term, meaning it was defined by what it didn't include rather than what it did. That is, if an organism was a eukaryote, but it wasn't a plant, animal, or fungus, it was classified as a protist. With this misconception rectified, we can simply acknowledge these three main kingdoms. Fungi are covered in the mycology series, and plants are covered in the botany series, but animals are the focus of this zoology series, so kingdom animalia is where we will spend all of our time. Within animalia, there are many different phyla, and that's where things start to get very, very complicated. There are so many types of animals, and the criteria that we use to categorize them begin to get blurry very quickly. Nevertheless, we must do our best to press forward, so let's talk about how we can use phylogeny to guide our exploration of the kingdom animalia, which allows us to arrive at a cladogram that looks like this. It's important to emphasize that this is a hypothesis, a scientific proposal based on the analysis of data, so it isn't set in stone. It could change in the future. Think of it as a general guide to animal diversity, a road map for our exploration. However, regardless of one's immediate perception, it is designed to include all known animal species. That is, all extant animals can be categorized into one of the animal phyla that appear here. So, where did this cladogram come from? It was first published by Drs. Gonzalo Giribet and Gregory D. Edgecombe in their book, The Invertebrate Tree of Life, which is linked in the description below should you wish to extend your learning beyond these tutorials. It is important to note that Drs. Giribet and Edgecombe didn't just make up this classification on their own. The creation of this tree was a massive undertaking. It is the synthesis of a multitude of works, and as of today at least, represents our most current understanding of animal phylogeny in the world. This figure has been altered slightly from the original, but in a way that does not change the phylogeny. We have merely switched the placement of Tenophora and Periphera, and rearranged it somewhat so that it more closely follows many zoology courses, meaning that we end with the chordates instead of Brachiozoa, terms that will soon be understood as we work our way through the series. Here's a look at the original figure compared to ours. Notice that the two cladograms convey the same information, that is, their phylogeny is the same. The only difference is the apparent order of organisms. Something that must be mentioned is that this tree looks different from others that are proposed. This is due in part because the total number of animal phyla is still in flux. In some modern cladograms, there are only 29 phyla, while in others there are up to 36. 
This is due to a few cryptic animals that make placement difficult, as well as recent analyses that either break down defunct phyla, like Mesozoa, which is now split into Dichiamida and Orthonectida, or reclassify phyla, like Pentastomida, which is now considered to be part of Arthropoda. Now, let's take a closer look at this massive cladogram, which will be our guide as we move through the series. All of this daunting nomenclature will become clear over several dozen tutorials, but for now, let's just try to take in as much as we can in order to get some important context. Zoom in on this corner here, and you'll see the phyla Periphera and Tenophora branch off at the same time. This is known as a polytomy, because the organism represented by this internal node has more than two immediate descendants. Essentially, it means we're not really sure which of these phyla are more ancestral to the rest of the animal kingdom. It has long been widely accepted that the sponges, which are found in phylum periphera, were the most basal animals, but this is misleading. Again, sponges aren't truly basal since they've been evolving for more than 500 million years within their own clade. In the same way that an orangutan is not a basal hominid compared to a human, as humans, chimps, bonobos, gorillas, and orangutans are all hominids, sponges are not some kind of more basal animal. Orangutans are equally distantly related to humans, gorillas, chimps, and bonobos. That is, Pongidae is a sister clade to Homininae. So again, this does not mean orangutans are more primitive, ancestral, or basal. Likewise, it's better to think of sponges as a sister clade to the rest of Kingdom Animalia. However, recent analyses have placed the comb jellies found in phylum Tenophora in that position. It is unclear if the Porifera sister or the Tenophora sister hypothesis is correct, but many textbooks still place the Periferans as the most basal and the Coanoflagellates as the sister clade to Kingdom Animalia, so that's what we've done here. Branching off from here, you'll see that our next classification involves the sister groups of Placozoans, Cnidarians, and all other animals, that is, those classified as bilateria. It has been a general consensus for years that the Cnidarians are likely the sister clade to all bilaterally symmetrical animals, though that leaves out Placozoans. What we are trying to convey is that the base of the animal phylogenetic tree is still controversial. It is possible the arrangement of periphera, tenophora, placozoa, and cnidaria will change in the future, but for now, this is what we will work with. Continuing on, we will notice that all remaining phyla are part of bilateria, animals that demonstrate bilateral symmetry in embryological development. However, it is the case that some animals, like many echinoderms, which refers to starfish and sea urchins, lack this symmetry as adults. The next node that branches off is Xena coelomorpha, which is considered to be a sister group to the Nephrozoa, and includes the clades Acelomorpha and Xenoturbolita. The clade Nephrozoa contains almost all animal phyla and well over one million named extant species. Nephrozoa is then broken up into the deuterostomes and the protostomes. In order to make sense of these major groups, we have to look at early development, where the differentiation of the cellular layers is taking place. Once an egg cell is fertilized by a sperm cell, it becomes a zygote, and an indentation called the blastopore forms on the embryo. Animals like echinoderms and chordates are called deuterostomes, or second mouths, because in these animals the indentation of the blastopore becomes the animal's anus. As the blastopore tunnels through the embryo of a deuterostome animal, it creates the rest of the digestive tract, ending with the mouth. These will be the last animals covered in this series, and they include some of the best known animals, from sharks and stingrays to cats and primates. In other animals, like segmented worms, mollusks, and arthropods, the initial opening in the blastopore generally develops into the mouth. These animals are called protostomes, or first mouths. As the blastopore tunnels through the embryo of a protostome animal, it creates the rest of the digestive tract, 
ending with the anus. These protostome animals can be further divided into two main groups, the spiralia and the ectisozoa. The group ectisozoa is monophyletic. All ectisozoans possess an outer covering called the cuticle that is periodically shed. This includes nematodes, arthropods, tardigrades, velvet worms, and others. Spiralia, meanwhile, includes the mollusks, annelids, platyhelminths, and many others. The term spiralia refers to spiral cleavage, a pattern of early development found only in members of this clade. Spiralia includes an incredible diversity of animal phyla and is notoriously difficult to define based on morphology. This clade in particular has undergone many dramatic revisions compared to ectisozoa and deuterostomia. It is likely there will be further clarifications of the spiralia clade, but its position as a sister group to ectisozoa is unlikely to change. Now, as we've been going over this cladogram, you've probably noticed a few phyla you're familiar with, as well as quite a few that you've never heard of. The animal phyla that contain the vast majority of all animal life, sometimes referred to as the nine animal phyla, are arthropoda, which includes the insects, arachnids, and crustaceans, mollusca, which includes the snails, slugs, cephalopods, and bivalves, Chordata, which includes all animals with a backbone, like snakes, birds, humans, and whales. Platyhelminthes, which includes the free-living and parasitic flatworms. Nematoda, which includes the roundworms. Annelida, which includes mostly segmented worms, like the earthworms. Cnidaria, which includes the corals and jellyfish. Echinodermata, which includes the sea stars and sea cucumbers and periphera, which includes the sponges. However, as you can see, there are many other animal clades, and in this series we are going to be discussing all of them. Now, let's not get too far ahead of ourselves. Before we dive headfirst into this astounding web of animal diversity, we need to cover the formation of kingdom animalia, so let's move forward and get just a bit more evolutionary context. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.